Hi, and welcome to Postscript. Nice to have you with us today. I'm John Peterson from the Arlington Institute, and we get together like this about once a month, and it's usually associated with our program that we do locally called Transition Talks. The Arlington Institute for almost 30 years now has sponsored a speaker series where we bring marvelous, provocative, interesting speakers from all over the world to come and talk about the extraordinary <coughs> change that's going on in the world is today. We're in the middle of an, an amazing kind of transition from one era to a new one, and the new world is going to be populated by new humans that operate in different ways and have different characteristics. And uh, the new world is going to have a whole new set of values and other such things. It's a, literally a paradigm shift. And so uh, we're happy to have our old friend, Dr. Harold Putoff, with us here today. Hal, it's nice to have you with us. Thanks, John. Good to be here. Uh, you're, you and I go back quite a ways. Uh, we've been oh, yes. Into the 70s a, or whatever. Yeah. Many yeah. hours, many towns, other places, all around the world kind of uh, doing on one thing or another. For our, uh, for our viewers, uh, you're a quantum physicist by education, PhD, right. yeah. and uh, uh, the, I guess you're best known for uh, being in the early 70s, starting the remote viewing program at uh, SRI, which was uh, at Stanford Research Institute mm -hmm. at the time, yeah. and uh, where you used psychics to uh, essentially work for the government, the spy on... Yeah, for the CIA and DIA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us quickly about that, and then we'll talk about some other kind of things. Well, I was... Uh, <clears throat> Straight physicist, uh, got my PhD at Stanford, had uh, uh, just published a quantum electronics book, graduate level, published in English, French, and Russian. And <clears throat> one of the things that uh, kind of bugged me was, well, what about consciousness? Is that, can we account for that in our physics and so on? So I was kind of searching around for ways to, to look into that kind of thing. And, and so, uh, just on a lark, I did an experiment with a, with a famous uh, psychic who perturbed some well-shielded quantum chips inside yeah. of Yeah, Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan, yeah. And I circulated that around, and so suddenly the CIA landed on my doorstep and said, oh, we've been looking for you. Uh, you know, the Russians and East Bloc countries are spending millions of dollars a year on, quote, ESP, and no scientist in America even believes there is such a thing. Yeah. And turns out I, my, my, my background, uh, aside from my physics, uh, has been in the intelligence community. Uh, I was a naval intelligence officer, spent several years at uh, NSA, National Security Agency. So he looked into my background and asked me, uh, since he saw I had all the clearances and everything, uh, well, since you're willing to do this experiment kind of on a lark, would you be willing to look at this field for us? And of course, their idea was, you know, I'm hoping you'll find it's all nonsense, so yep. we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that grew into, what, 23-year program, uh, working for many parts of the government, uh, top secret programs and so on, and training army intelligence officers and, yeah. and that kind of thing. But at some point, I wanted to get back to my physics, so uh, I had a, accepted a position to be director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin and took it thinking, okay, well, that's the end of my work with the government, uh, and that's good. <laughs> but it was only a few years later, and um, the government uh, was looking into how to deal with the UFO problem, as you would say. Mm -hmm. We say UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. And so, <clears throat> you're going to look into something weird like that. Who are you going to call? Right. Well, <laughs> there I am, and... Uh, <laughs> So I got involved in that program. That's what I'll be speaking to your audience today about. Yeah, and we're really looking forward to that. And uh, uh, you and I have always had this ongoing conversation for the yeah, mm. better part of 30 years almost mm -hmm. now about right. uh, whether there was life somewhere else and how it all worked. And we've been involved in a couple of interesting little projects where we tried to anticipate what uh, kind of the disclosure or if oh, yeah. alien life showed up, you know, how... how how 
what would the implications be, how would it change the world, and so on. And yeah, so, those are some of the most interesting uh, you know, sort of projects that you yeah. and I were involved in, yeah. But now, uh, uh, you're involved in something that, from my point of view, is really quite profound. Uh, for years, for decades, uh, it was uh, kind of known and presumed that there was some kind of interaction with UFOs, UAPs, with alien life. I mean, there's reports, thousands if not millions mm -hmm. of reports all over the world for years and years that something was going on and systematically over time then different other countries started to mm -hmm. declassify their reports and their their history and these kinds of things. But the United States always was the kind of the holdout. Yeah. And right. uh, and so you had all this other stuff going on and the US always said, oh well, uh, no, we don't have anything about any of that. And, and of then course it, the truth of the matter is that in the deep background, there was a continuous study yeah. from, from the 40s uh, onward. And, uh, but most of it, we thought we'd never see the light of day. And then suddenly, December 2017, New York Times had a front page story on having dug out the existence of this program. And so <clears throat> up till then, the media had sort of treated this as, as sort of a tinfoil hat crowd thing yeah. for Friday afternoon if you didn't have any other news or whatever. But now, suddenly you had people coming forward, like senators and pilots from F-18 uh, jets, off carriers, and uh, people in the intelligence and government communities starting to come forth. So that was really sort of a, a, a gate, yeah. gate, gate changer, game changer. Yeah. Well, as I've told you, I think it's uh, kind of the watershed that mm -hmm. when you and some of your uh, associates and friends who were involved in some of these programs and came forward and all stood on the stage. I mean, really class act, uh, serious kind of people uh, and said, this is very real and we ought to do something about it. And we've got hundreds of case studies and right. videos mm -hmm. and all kinds of things. And suddenly it became the de facto the United States has been decided that uh, that, uh, that they're going to come out or or, or begin the process of disclosure, I guess. Is That's right. Recently, uh, a number of videos of, taken by F-18 pilots have been released. And uh, so it took a bit of time, but finally the Navy came out and announced that, in fact, these are not fake or whatever. These are real things. And we don't understand uh, what they are. And so they admitted for the first time, actually the first time in the government, to say, yes, we have evidence of unidentified aerial phenomena that we simply can't identify, and we know it's important. And so finally, they actually issued uh, orders for pilots, F-18 pilots, typically off of carriers and so on, to report their sightings. It turns out sightings have been, been going on for well over you know, decades. Uh, <clears throat> but the pilots didn't want to report them because yeah. you know, they're going to think I'm drunk or smoking yeah, right, dope or something, right. and I'll lose my flight status. Now the Navy has issued uh, a requirement that pilots must report any sightings because they've had some uh, encounters where it, it involved possible safety concerns. Yeah. Flying right between a couple of jets that are on a mission and suddenly phew, something comes through. And so, so it's, it's, it's a new era with, with, in the government's view and the military's view toward uh, at least admitting something's going on. Yeah. What do you think is going on? Actually, I'm not sure. We have lots of data, lots of it unexplained, um, good data to work with, good pilot reports, but uh, generally speaking, uh, exactly what's going on. Uh, we well, I say. mean, there's some, uh, let's, let's go back a little bit. And, you know, historically, there's some kind of iconic events <laughs> that everybody knows about Roswell and uh, so on, where mm -hmm. these craft right. uh, crashed. What do you think about that? I mean, do you, is, is that all real or not, or what? Well, I don't specifically know about Roswell because my <clears throat> involvement has been looking at, at recent data. Um, there may have been some crashes. Um, 
<laughs> We're not going to discuss them, John. You know that. <laughs> well, there are uh, uh, yeah, right. claims and people coming forward with uh, pieces of material that right. they, they yeah. came claim came from crashes. Right. So, yeah. so we're at least taking it seriously enough to examine materials right. like that that get provided to us, see if there's anything we can learn from it. Yeah. Do you have any sense, for instance, from your background, whether, what, are they coming, where, where these vehicles are coming from? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm being, as a scientist, and it's my role to do this, I'm being very careful to not try to speculate so in fact, I've got a whole model called the ultra-terrestrial model, which names every possibility of, uh, you know, what could this be? Is it from other dimensions? Is it from other planets and other solar systems? Uh, is there some secret, say, corporate America aerospace yeah, group? Yeah. Uh, or some stranded uh, people from elsewhere? I mean, until we actually have the data, uh, I'm really staying away, and, well, and actually all my colleagues generally are staying away from trying to put the label well, on it. Which well, of course it's, a, it's, a, it's a good position, as a matter of fact. You and I have a, uh, an old friend, Jacques Vallée, who mm -hmm. has uh, uh, built a very compelling and profound kind of a career mm -hmm. around suggesting that these things are not at all uh, the f kind of the physical phenomena that we think of them are, or at least that's not the origins of what it is. And so there's a whole spectrum of possibilities here. In the, uh, and obviously there's an effort to try to convince you that it's all physical or manifest into this dimension or whatever it turns out to be, but it could be. It could be, it could be something else entirely that just presents itself as, as physical. So. There, there are more unknowns uh, and many questions to, to try to answer than there are knowns at this point. Well, we've had people here in, in this speaker series at Transition Talks who <laughs> talked about archons and jinn and other dimensional kind of entities who all can manifest themselves and do shape-shifting and come in and so on, and I've literally sat here across from somebody as, as, as closely as you, a friend of mine, and had him say, well, yeah, I watched this black helicopter that turned into a, a, a crow and then turned into a mm -hmm. UFO, you know, or something. Right, and right. you say, God, what in the world? How does this all work? Yeah, you mentioned Jacques Vallée. He's, uh, first of all, he has this wonderful book called Wonders in the Sky, where he traced, uh, really, it was a quality approach, all the way back to you know thousands of years ago, uh, and then on up through the centuries of these kinds of kinds of observations, and <clears throat> as part of his presentation, he and my colleague Eric Davis put together a seven-layer uh, kind of model for what could be happening, ranging all all the way from purely physical through interdimensional things up to spiritual manifestations. So it's <clears throat> When, when we switch to the concept of unidentified aerial phenomena, that, that's really a good label. Yeah. 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 Well, tell, tell us, uh, you're involved now with uh, To The Stars Academy, and talk to us a little bit about what you're trying to do, because I guess from, um, in, <coughs> you're, you're probably the most substantial kind of entity or organization that's, uh, focused on this area and uh, and working in multiple kind of dimensions to try to uh, uh, generate more awareness about it and understand Yeah, it. Uh, my uh, becoming part of founding to the Stars Academy of Arts and Science, uh, interesting history. <clears throat> Many of us that were working in the program that, that got revealed by New York Times and other people, senators coming out and talking about it, Nonetheless, in the government, it's it's a tough road to hoe. It's not exactly career enhancing to say yeah, right. I want to be in charge of the UFO issue, and so a lot of data that that could be shared. Uh, for example, the videos that are now all over the internet and uh, on TV uh, were just languishing in Pentagon servers, and um, but they could be declassified and, and and released and so on and so. A number of us that were involved in um, the program 
decided, you know, there, there should be an open group of people who know a lot about what's going on, and uh, we need to bring what can be shared out, out into the public and get a conversation going. <clears throat> so several of us got together and formed uh, To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the fellow who got it started was Tom DeLong of Blink-182, a rock star. Yeah. But it turned out that in the background, he's always been interested in UFOs and ESP and that kind of thing. And he had a lot of good connections into people in aerospace corporations and the government and said, you know, there, there should be an organization that to the degree we can be discussing this in the open, seriously, you know, we should do that. So he decided to form to the stars. Uh, and so some of the people we have associated uh, with, with our group are, for example, Lou Elizondo, who in fact ran the program in the Pentagon and uh, left to come be right. as part of To the Stars. We have uh, Chris Mellon, who is a former Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, and uh, so he's part of our operation. Uh, Steve Justice, who is, yeah. uh, ran uh, black programs with billion dollar budgets for Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. He's part of our, our mm -hmm. group. Uh, Jim Simavan, who I knew for years from CIA, he's actually a true James Bond kind of guy, worked in the director of operations, and so he's joined our group. And then uh, we, we pulled together some, some scientists to, yeah. to work with and so on. And so uh, our activities have ranged all over the place from behind the scenes. We do end up uh, talking to congressional committees and senators and so on. I briefed congressional committees twice on, yeah. on the program. Um, and then uh, in the science area and aerospace area, uh, we're trying to raise funds to do some, some really forward-looking uh, look into the best of what we know scientifically to try to explain how such craft, if they're physical, uh, could operate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and then the general science uh, group uh, that says, you know, there, there are a lot of taboo subjects, UAPs, UFO, maybe SETI, all that psychokinesis, whatever. Uh, these should not be throwing babies out with bathwater, we should, we should take a good look at them. And so, and we're forming a good uh, relationships with uh, corporate entities, with government entities, uh, to do serious uh, kind of thing. And um, TTSA, for example, last season had a series of episodes uh, on uh, the History Channel called Unidentified. And it wasn't uh, your usual UFO hunters or something like that. Instead, it was primarily Lou Elizondo actually interviewing the F-18 pilots, interviewing the radar operators that have been involved with tracking all this stuff. And so actually getting facts out instead of fiction. Yeah. And so that's that, that edu ed educational yeah. aspect uh, we think is important. So it's kind of like educational and entertainment and research and you kind of right. evolved across the whole uh, right. across the whole board. Yeah, and uh, again, there are many people in the what in the UFO space, but that there's a substance and there's um, uh, a kind of a critical mass about what you've what you've all brought together that is really quite encouraging and appealing. I've suggested to you that I believe that uh, a decade from now uh, uh, this whole subject matter will have been opened up so much and will have turned into something quite mm -hmm. different than mm -hmm. what it is right now and potentially even ongoing conversations with alien life or on extraterrestrial life or whatever uh, and, and the world will be so different then you'll be able to point back and say to uh, folks like you and your your associates at TTSA, that was the watershed. That was the when the window opened right then and that began to legitimate. Uh, and one of the things that uh, is going to emerge from this is that 
there are other countries, of course, who also have their sighting yeah. archives and at least claim to have some pieces of craft and that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> but they learned early on that sharing it with the U.S. government was not such a great idea because it disappears into a black hole and yeah. they never learn anything. So uh, once we set up uh, to the Stars Academy, um, we've gone back and made connections with these leaders in foreign countries. Uh, we've talked to generals from Brazil and whatever. And so uh, we've said, you know, look, this is a public benefit corporation. We're going to share data that we obtain. So if you come up with stuff that you think we should be looking at, whether it's videos or interviews with your pilots or pieces of material that seem exotic or whatever, uh, collaborate with us. Yeah. And we'll see this uh, sees the light of day. And so we have many conversations going on with people yeah. from other countries. And so that's going to be a big uh, yeah, sort a, of game changer. Yeah, there's a kind of movement. What, what's yeah. a public benefit corporation, by the way? Public benefit corporation, um, it sort of uh, kind of lies halfway between just, uh, I don't know, money raising kind of thing like crowdfunding or an IP corporation or whatever. You know, it's, it's kind of in the middle. It's, it's a new category where... Uh, People can buy shares. Uh, they're not yet to be traded uh, right. on, in, in the market, but it's an SEC corporation. Eventually, if, they, if we have an IP, they'll be able to convert their shares and trade them on the market. But meanwhile, it's a big piece of the public benefit corporation that whatever you're doing, you have to show that you're benefiting the public, mm -hmm. independent of you know, sharing shares with individuals. Uh, so that's why providing information with these uh, TV interviews and so yeah. on is, is part of that. You know, uh, as would be natural, I guess, there's a lot of criticism or people that are sniping about TTSA, about, oh, you guys are all still the front for the CIA and, and, and things like that. Uh, and, and obviously you all have relationships, continuing relationships with the government, or you can't forget what you knew and the, and the people that you knew. But, <clears throat> the, uh, but there's something uh, a lot kind of uh, bigger here. Uh, and by that I mean that the, the government uh, and, and potential, particularly the people, your associates, Mm -hmm. come out of the, the defense and the intelligence community, and uh, they're oriented toward, toward threats. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. the business. Right. that's the business. That's the mindset. And so I've listened to any of a number of interviews where people were all critical of uh, Lou Elizondo or who, who, who else, uh, <laughs> a bit saying that all they want to do is look at threats. And Well, uh, that's their business. That's where they came from. I mean, I, I've been in that business in the past, and... So I understand about it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's the whole business of this emergence in the, of, uh, of a new era in terms of the evolution of humanity mm -hmm. that is, uh, that, that's, I'm particularly interested in. Can you talk at all about that? And have you thought much about that kind of aspect of uh, where the species is going and how mm. this opening up to new ideas and new a larger sense of reality? Uh, I think I can. Uh, let me start with the, 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 okay. the concern that the critics have said that we're just some front for the CIA or, or whatever. <clears throat> Although many of us come out of uh, intelligence and uh, defense community yeah. and so on, believe me, we are not a front for them. They would just assume that we went away <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, if anything, the fact that there's so much more discussion and conversation in, in the public media yeah. about this, that makes problems for them because yeah. now they're drowning in FOIA requests and right. so on. So, so no, no, we're, we're, we're a group of people who have, uh, you know, sort of are thinking, yeah. as you say, have been concerned about threat in the past. Um, <clears throat> that, that's just the way it is. But uh, we think that there's a bigger issue here, mm -hmm. bigger issue here involved. And... Uh, you know, if it should eventually lead to, let's say, contact with aliens or mm -hmm. with multidimensional creatures or, you know, who knows what. I mean, obviously, that's going to make a big difference. 
And so from my own background, uh, starting out as a really straight arrow physicist, and then getting drawn into the remote viewing program by the CIA and DIA, and then finding out, oh my gosh, uh, there are people who just sitting in their armchairs at home can, with a little bit of training, a little bit of instruction, really see events uh, yeah. elsewhere and so on. So that opens up a whole new window that, gee, there's a lot going yeah, on. Yeah, reality there. isn't what we reality thought Reality isn't yeah. you know, what you ordinarily think it is. And then finally getting into the UFO area and seeing the complexities there, and it's unbelievably complex. So the main take home message is that uh, our usual sort of ordinary view of reality is really, really a small element. And um, I mean, there are all kinds of things. I mean, like healing healers and that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. As I, I'm also a f uh, fellow of the Fetzer Institute, and we look at some sh shaman healing in China and that kind of thing. But there's some amazing things going on. So, so I think that each of these are all pushes in new directions to say the human being is much more right. than what ordinarily our educational system tells us it is. And so, uh, so there have always been these, quote, fringe groups who pursue these elements, but it doesn't become part of the mainstream. But I think now that we have many elements coming forth with better and better uh, documentation, yeah. you might say. For example, in the UFO area or the UAP area, we now have military platforms that are so technically exquisite you can no longer say, well, maybe it was just a flare or something. Oh, yeah. No, you've, you've got great detailed data. And in the uh, alternative medicine area, we, we now have excellent uh, investigations and more DNA analysis and, and you name it. So, so there are areas like that uh, are, are showing new, new outcomes. And uh, of course, in the remote, remote viewing era, so-called area, um, I mean, that, that's just a whole new element of finding out that uh, sure. there's a whole talent within the human being that's, I mean, we found in the program that we did that, you know, it's a bell curve like every, everything else. You got virtuosos at one end of the scale, tone deaf people at the other, but most anybody in the middle can learn to play an instrument, play a tune. Well, it turns out the same thing with uh, yeah. ordinarily gets labeled paranormal phenomena, that it, it's a bell curve distribution. Some countries like India take it for granted. Yeah. Countries uh, in the Western uh, culture basically don't. And so that's coming to the fore. So all these things are beginning to knit together and beginning to reveal a uh, much expanded uh, yep. view of, uh, of, of, of human life. And it even gets to the point where, for example, in remote viewing, uh, we did some challenges about uh, invest. If, if remote viewers are so great, why don't they make money at the stock market or Las Vegas or whatever? And so we did some experiments where we used that process to do silver futures. Right. In 30 days in the market, we made $260,000. Right. And so the fact that you, in principle, could even see into the future uh, and have actual documented proof with great statistics and money in your pocket. Right you begin to realize, well, there's a whole aspect that people are not absolutely tied to the present. There's some element of... Right. And it turns out that, fortunately, at the same time, our expansion of ideas in quantum physics with quantum entanglement and non-locality and all these kinds of things that physicists are very busy gathering really good data on, but they haven't made it into the mainstream thinking as to who we are and, yeah. and what we can do. But when all of that gets integrated, you know, we're going to have a whole new picture. Yeah, well, what you've described uh, quite uh, delightfully is this convergence from multiple kind of dimensions mm -hmm. uh, that is reconfiguring the kind of the essential nature of who human beings are, the understanding of who we are, and moving us from one era to another one. And in that process, all the old ideas kind of implode or collapse, and a whole bunch of new ones come up. And what you and your uh, associates at uh, TTSA are doing is uh, an integral part of that, an mm -hmm. important part of that. And uh, we're really pleased to have you here today and looking forward to, to what you have to say. Well, I'm looking forward to yeah. 
They're presenting my data. Yeah. Yes. We appreciate your being with us. Thanks, Hal. Well, for thanks for the invitation. Yeah. I appreciate it. And thank you for being with us. Uh, we try to do this uh, on a regular basis. We'll be back uh, about once a month. Uh, and we've got uh, Joni Petrie coming uh, next month. Joni Petrie is a world-class astrologer, quite a force on the internet. And she's going to come and talk about long-term what uh, the astrological kind of indicators are for the changes that are coming in the next five to seven years. And so that'll be interesting. And we hope that you'll come. You can find out complete information on our program at uh, transitiontalks.org, transitiontalks.org. And uh, we're located here in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, just 100 miles from Washington and Baltimore. And it's a wonderful little resort town where you can come and uh, spend a weekend and get provoked uh, intellectually as well as get massaged and uh, all kinds of good things for your uh, for your mind and your spirit and your body. And we hope that you'll come and be with us. And so thanks again. I'm John Peterson from the Arlington Institute. And we thank you for coming and being with us in Postscript.